for this morning, we are in Mark's Gospel, chapter 9. And I'm going to read verses 2 to 29, a little bit lengthy, but I want to read these two stories back to back here in Mark's Gospel, chapter 9, starting at verse 2. Now, after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John and led them up on a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. His clothes became shining, exceedingly white like snow, such as no launderer on earth can whiten them. And Elijah appeared with them, with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. Then Peter answered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here, and let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, because he did not know what to say, for they were greatly afraid. And a cloud came and overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud, saying, This is my beloved Son, hear him. And suddenly, when they had looked around, they saw no one anymore, but only Jesus with themselves. Now as they came down from the mountain, he commanded them that they should tell no one the things they had seen, till the Son of Man had risen from the dead. And so they kept his word to themselves, questioning what the rising from the dead meant. And they asked him, saying, Why do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? And then he answered and told them, Indeed, Elijah is coming first and restores all things. And how is it written concerning the Son of Man, that he must suffer many things and be treated with contempt? But I say to you that Elijah has also come, and they did to him whatever they wished, as it is written of him. Verse 14, And when he came to the disciples, he saw a great multitude around them and scribes disputing with them. Immediately when they saw him, all the people were greatly amazed and running to him, greeted him. And he asked the scribes, what are you discussing with them? Then one of the crowd answered and said, teacher, I brought you my son who has a mute spirit. And wherever it seizes him, it throws him down. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth and becomes rigid. So I spoke to your disciples that they should cast it out, but they could not. He answered him and said, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him to me. And then they brought him to him. And when he saw him, immediately the spirit convulsed him, and he fell on the ground and, and wallowed, foaming at the mouth. And so he asked his father, How long has this been happening to him? And he said, From childhood. And often he has thrown him a both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. And immediately the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. And when Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, deaf and dumb spirit, I command you, come out of him and enter him no more. And then the spirit cried out, convulsed him greatly, and came out of him. And he became as one dead, so that many said, he is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. And when he had come into the house, his disciples asked him privately, why could we not cast it out? And so he said to them, this kind can come out by nothing but prayer and fasting. Let's pause there and pray. Lord, we thank you that you love us so much that you would send Jesus to die on a cross for us and that you would reveal this story through the pages of the Bible. And as we come to this particular story, these two stories together, we ask, Lord, that you would speak to us today, minister your grace to our hearts. We're needy, hungry, thirsty people. And we thank you, Lord, that you're so faithful to meet us here time and again. So we draw near to you, Lord. We ask you to use this passage, these two stories, to speak to us today. We praise you in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Well, here in Matthew, uh, sorry, Mark chapter 9, I wanted to uh, share these two stories back to back as they are written for us back to back because they are a picture of two opposite extremes. The first part of this ninth chapter starts out with a literal mountaintop experience where Jesus displays his glory. And then they move from the mountain down to the valley. And you go from this mountaintop experience to this very low valley experience where you see this desperate father and a demon-possessed son. And really, when you look at these two stories back to back, it is somewhat of a picture of our lives in that there are some times when we feel like we're on top of the mountain 
and everything is going well, and life is wonderful, and the highs can be really high. And then there are times we find ourselves in the valley, and it is desperate, and uh, things are discouraging, and uh, the lows can be pretty low. Now, while the majority of life typically happens somewhere in the middle of these two extremes, the fact of the matter is that because we do live in a fallen, sinful world, it is more common for us to find ourselves living in or near the valley than it is to always be having mountaintop experiences. That just isn't realistic. That we go from mountaintop to mountaintop to mountaintop, that does not exp express life in, in reality. Okay, nobody lives like that. There are plenty of times that we do get a glimpse of wonderful things that we would say, this is a mountaintop experience. But most of life, the common part of life happens in or near the valley. Um, life is not like one continuous ride on Magic Mountain at Disneyland, okay? It's more like a continuous ride on the Scooby-Doo roller coaster that gets stuck halfway on the track. <laughs> That's more realistic about what life is like. The good news is, though, that whether we find ourselves on the mountain at those times or somewhat more often in the valley, Jesus is there in both places. See that in these stories. He is both on the mountain and he is also in the valley. He's there with us regardless. There's a popular song right now, Zach Williams and Dolly Parton, that there was Jesus and part of the chorus of that song goes, on the mountains, in the valleys, there was Jesus. In the shadows of the alleys, there was Jesus. In the fire, in the flood, there was Jesus. Always is and always was. No, I never walk alone. Never walk alone. You are always there. So I have titled today's teaching, Mountains or Valleys, Jesus is There. And we're going to talk about all this, but before we do, let's look at the actual events in these two stories in our Bibles. So again, you have two scenes. You have the first part of Mark chapter 9, the scene on the mountain. Second part of chapter 9 is the scene in the valley when they come off of the mountain. But let's first talk about what happens here on the mountain. If you look again in your Bibles at verse 2, it says, Now after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John and led them up on a high mountain apart by themselves. So they leave the other nine disciples. Out of the twelve, Jesus takes just three, Peter, James, and John. You often see in the Bible where Jesus does some exclusive thing with those three, Peter, James, and John. And it's not that he's showing favoritism. It's never good to show favoritism to people. Parents to kids or employer, employers to employees or whatever the case might be. But the reality is that some people you're going to feel closer to than others. Out of the 12, Jesus felt closer to these three than he did the, the majority of them. And so he does some things exclusively with them. Peter, James, and John were part of what we would call Jesus' inner circle. And he takes them, it says, after six days up on a high mountain. Now, what does it mean by after six days? It refers to the events previously that we didn't read. And what we find before the story of the Mount of Transfiguration is that's when Jesus takes his disciples, all 12 of, 12 of them, up to Caesarea Philippi, north of the Golan Heights. And it is there that Jesus asks them, who do men say that I am? What is the word on the street about my identity? And it is there that Peter makes this great profession of faith. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. After they say, well, people say you're John the Baptist, some say you're Jeremiah, some say Elijah or another prophet. It is Peter who makes that bold declaration when Jesus says, okay, but who do you say that I am? Peter says, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. They're there in Caesarea Philippi, and then six days later, Jesus takes the three, Peter, James, and John, up on a high mountain. Now, tradition says that the high mountain was Mount Tabor. But Mount Tabor in Israel would be a hard hike to make in six days from Caesarea Philippi. Plus, it's not really a high mountain. It's only 1,800 feet. 
it is more likely that this story takes place on Mount Hermon or Mount Hermon because that's where they are. Caesarea Philippi is at the base of Mount Hermon. It makes more sense, and so Bible scholars are divided. Is this Mount Tabor? Is this Mount Hermon? But it makes more sense that they're already in that area, that they would hike up Mount Hermon. It's 9,000 feet. Mount Hermon is the place where they have the only ski resort in Israel. I've been there in the, in, in the thick of summer, and you can see still snow on the peak of Mount Hermon, even in the, in the summertime. And when it is open as a ski resort during the winter months, it's kind of an amazing thing. You could actually, in Israel, drive from the desert to ski within two hours. So this is Mount Hermon. This is probably where the story takes place, but it's not all that you know, necessary to you know, be certain because the Bible doesn't say exactly where they are. This much we do know. He takes Peter, James, and John with him up on a high mountain at some place. And then it says in verse 2, that Jesus was transfigured before them. Transfigured before them. The Greek word of the New Testament here for transfigured is metamorpho. Metamorpho is where we get our English word metamorphosis. There's a transformation that happens here with Jesus. He is changed before them. It's temporary, but there's this temporary um, pulling back of the veil so that Peter, James, and John can see a glimpse of the glory of God. Jesus is transfigured before them. There's this metamorphosis that happens. And Mark describes in verse 3 this, this transformation as bright and white, like this glow around Jesus, both his countenance and his clothing. And you get the idea that Mark is struggling trying to find words to communicate just how bright and white this is. So the only thing he can compare it to, because it's, in, it's incomparable to anything else on earth. So Mark says, well, it's kind of like as white as snow. All right, thanks, Mark. And then he adds, or his, and his clothing was as brilliant as what any launderer soap could possibly clean clothing. So that's the best he can do. And of course, you know, if he were writing today, maybe he would say bleach white. I don't know. But the bleach wasn't around in the day. He's trying to describe just how brilliant and white and glowing the countenance and the clothing of Jesus was. Jesus is transformed here. Now, what Jesus is showing them is a glimpse of his glory. The Hebrew word is Shekinah, the very presence of God. Jesus is God in flesh. And for this moment, temporarily, Jesus is showing Peter, James, and John just the manifest, brilliant, white glow of the glory of God. No doubt it's not the fullness, or else these guys' eyes, eyeballs would be burned out, right? Seen from Raiders of the Lost Ark. But anyway, <laughs> some of you too young to know what I'm talking about. So no doubt it's just a glimpse, but they're seeing this wonderful display of the brilliant, white, illuminating glory of God. And Peter, James, and John are amazed at this. And if that wasn't enough, who should appear on the scene but the prophets Elijah and Moses? Elijah and Moses standing there, the Bible says, talking with Jesus. And so Peter starts to freak out. He's like, whoa, look at this, Elijah and Moses with Jesus here. Now, listen, Elijah had been dead for more than about 900 years at this point. Moses had been dead for about 1,400 years by this point. So it means that those two prophets had appeared with Jesus, somehow by God's providence, departing for the moment from paradise to be in the presence of Jesus, either just their spirits, or perhaps they retained some kind of, you know, glorified body for this scene here on this Mount of Transfiguration. But here they are, they've been dead for centuries. And why Elijah and Moses, of all the people who could have appeared with Jesus? Well, because Elijah represents the prophets, and Moses represents the law, and Jesus came to fulfill the law and the prophets. So it makes sense that these two would be there speaking with Jesus, because Jesus is about to fulfill on the cross a little while later the, the purpose of his coming, a fulfillment of the law and the prophets. And so there they are with Jesus, Elijah and Moses. And by the way, I think we're going to perhaps at some point see Elijah and Moses make another appearance in the future. Because if you know your Bibles from Revelation chapter 11, it talks about two witnesses who come during the tribulation period in the future to proclaim the good news of Jesus as witnesses. And when you look at what the, the witnesses do, 
in terms of their miracles. It, it parallels the miracles of Elijah and the miracles of Moses so that people like myself believe, and I'm not the only one, I'm talking about you know, Bible scholars and different people believe that in Revelation 11, the potential for those two witnesses to be Moses and Elijah who will yet appear again on the earth. But that aside, back to our story. When Peter sees them, it's, he says in verse 5, Rabbi, he says to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. You know, this, this is a good day. It's good for us to be here. And let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And I love verse 6, because he did not know what to say. <laughs> he didn't know what to say, for they were greatly afraid. Now, I'm going to comment on that a little bit in a moment, but first, a couple of observations. Question, how was it that they recognized Elijah and Moses? These guys have been dead for centuries. How did they recognize that they were Elijah and Moses, except that either God had revealed it to them, or more likely, this is a biblical proof text for the fact that someone in their spirit or in their glorified body still bears their physical likeness even after they die. Why is that important to know? I can't tell you how many times I've gotten the question, will I recognize my loved one in heaven? Will they recognize me? It is clear here that centuries after these guys had died, they were still recognizable because something about their appearance in their spirit form or whether or not they had temporarily some kind of physical form, they still bore a resemblance to their physical identity such that they were recognizable. You will be able to recognize your loved ones. They will be able to recognize you in heaven. Consider, if nothing else, when Jesus appeared to his disciples post-resurrection from the dead, having a glorified body, they still could recognize him. So we do bear a resemblance to our likeness now when we are in heaven. No doubt it's going to be a more improved likeness of who you are, okay? In the first service, I had this guy in the third row go, amen. I don't know if he was talking about him or his wife, but anyway, <laughs> I'm sure it'll be a better likeness than the one we have now, but you'll still be recognizable. Another observation here is back to this thing about when Peter makes this suggestion to build three tabernacles or shelters, one for Jesus, one for Elijah, one for Moses, and I, I love the way it just says it, he didn't know what to say. In fact, in some translations of your Bible, it's, it's, verse 6 is actually a parenthetical comment. It's, it's written in parentheses because the writer is basically saying, you know, I'm just letting you know, Peter had no clue why he said that. <laughs> you know, this is the guy who's like, you know, a, a few you know, chapters earlier, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. You know, what a bold declaration. And then he's saying some numbskull thing like, how about we build three tiki huts for you guys? <laughs> Like, why do, we need, why do we need tiki huts? Well, I don't know. You know, I just, I just thought it was a good idea. I mean, you and I can relate to this. You know, have you ever been in a moment of like real excitement or whatever, and, and then you say something awkward and you're like, ah, why did I say that? It, it happens. It happens. And so Peter's like, we ought to, you know, build these little huts here. For goodness sakes, this is Jesus, the son of God. All right. He doesn't need a hut to hide out in, you know. People come by and visit him on this mountain. What are you talking about? Elijah and Moses have just come from the dead. Do they, do they need a hut to hang around in? I don't think so. They're heading back to paradise. Thank you, Pete. I just put up a parking lot, you know, if you... Anyway, I'm... it's all right. It's okay. I, I just, I digress. I tell you what Peter is really doing here. I mean, you know, he's, he's nervous, but he's genuine in that he wants to preserve the moment. He wants to preserve the moment. I mean, all of us can relate to this. You have some special event in your life, a honeymoon, a, a, a special vacation, a family event. You, you don't want it to end. If it's, a, if it's a wonderful thing, you don't want it to end. And you're, you're taking pictures and selfies and you're, you're wanting to capture the moment and you don't want it to end. I get why he's saying this. There's a lot of us, when you're on the mountaintop and you're having some wonderful experience, you wish it would never end, and you want to preserve it. And it highlights the fact that everybody is like that, really. Everybody loves to stay on the mountaintop experience, but you can't live there. 
because reality is in the valley. And before they leave and climb down from the mountain, it tells us in verses 7 and 8 that God speaks. It says in verse 7, And a cloud came and overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud, saying, This is my beloved Son, hear him. And suddenly when they had looked around, they saw no one anymore, but only Jesus with themselves. See, it's like as soon as they tried to preserve the moment, God said, I want you to listen to my son, but now I want you to move on. Heaven will be a mountaintop experience that will never end, but this is not heaven right now. And everybody has to come off the mountain at some point. Oh, you might get a glimpse of God's goodness and of his glory from time to time with certain experiences that you will live out in the course of your life here on earth. But much of life takes place in the valley of reality where there are demonic influences and sometimes unanswered prayer and helpless parents and tormented children and frustrated disciples because all of that is what they find when they get back to the valley. Because in the valley is where faith and reality meet. Anyone can enjoy the mountaintop and feel really cozy while you're there. Meanwhile, the world also needs Jesus in the valley. And because that's where you and I spend a considerable amount of our time, we need Jesus in the valley too. And so verse 9 in our, in our text here says, Now as they came down from the mountain." They came down from the mountain, and scene two now is the valley. And when they come down from the mountain, here's what they encounter. Jesus notices the nine disciples who were left back, right, out of the twelve. The nine were still left out of the base of the mountain. He notices them disputing with some of the scribes. Now, scribes were religious leaders of the day. They were considered legal experts. They were the ones who would transcribe the Hebrew text. And Jesus sees his nine disciples disputing with the scribes. I, I wonder if Jesus is looking at this as he's walking towards them going, oh, they only left you for a couple hours, goodness <laughs> sakes. But here they are disagreeing, disputing. And so Jesus asks the scribes in verse 16, when he gets down off the mountain, he sees them disputing. And he says in verse 16, he asks the scribes, what are you discussing with them? And what happens is a dad in the crowd speaks up and he says, listen, they're debating my situation and here's my situation. Verse 17, he says to, to Jesus, teacher, I brought you my son who has a mute spirit and when, wherever it seizes him, it throws him down. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, becomes rigid. So I spoke to your disciples and that they should cast it out, but they could not. And so this dad has a son here and the son is possessed by a demon. Now we know it's possession because at the end of the story, Jesus cast the demon out of him. We don't know what the background, we don't know how young this boy is. Is he, is he like a child? Is he like a young adult? We don't, we don't have any mention about the guy's life, but we know that he's possessed by a demon. And this demon is doing violent things within him, possessing this boy, such that he exhibits uh, almost like epileptic-like symptoms and seizures, and, and, he, and he convulses, and he foams at the mouth, and, and, and the dad says, sometimes this demon turns tries to throw my son into the fire, like at a campfire to kill him or drown him in water. And this dad is desperate. This dad is like, I, I, I don't know what else to do. And, and what we also find here is that apparently while Jesus was up on a mountain with Peter, James, and John, that the dad brought his demon-possessed son to the nine. It tells us later, because he says there, the, the man says, I, I brought him to your disciples that they should cast him out and they could not. So here's where my mind goes. What did those guys try? <laughs> I start imagining the conversation. This dad is like, my son is demon possessed. Where's, where's Jesus? Well, he's up on the mountain with Peter, James, and John. All right, all right. Then you, got, you guys are like the B team, right? Well, <laughs> I mean, we think we're the A team. Well, yeah, but Peter, James, and John, they're up there. So they're A, a team. You guys are B team. But can't you, can't you at least try to cast the demon out of my son? You guys are also followers of do something. So th this is not in the Bible, okay? Don't have anybody email me. But I, I, I'm just thinking, you know, so then, so Andrew's like, well, you know, I mean, there was a time when I've seen Jesus smear mud on somebody. Let's try that. <laughs> so they're like all smearing mud on this kid. Maybe, maybe I'll stand back now. All right, demon, come out. 
that's not it. <laughs> Philip goes, you know what? Come to think of it, I've seen Jesus use spit. <laughs> How about we try that? No. You know, they're spitting on the guy, trying to, Judas is standing off on the side going, you know what, we should be charging the dad right now. We should be charging the dad. They're asking Thomas, Thomas, what do you think we should do? Thomas is like, ah, I doubt anything will work. <laughs> so that's the scene. I, just now you know how to pray for me. I'm thinking that kind of stuff. And Jesus comes upon them. He's like, what in the world? What are you guys trying to do here? The kid's all smeared with mud and spit, you know. And I, Jesus shaking his head. That's why in verse 19, he calls him a faithless generation. What, what are you guys doing here? And so the dad brings the boy to Jesus, and the dad says in verse 22, if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, verse 23, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. And I love verse 24. Because it just shows the vulnerability and desperation of this dad. And it says, immediately the father of the child cried out and said with tears. He's crying. He's weeping. He says, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. I love that honesty. He says, I believe, but I have some unbelief too. I have faith, but I have some doubts too. There's times I feel strong and there are times I feel weak. And Jesus doesn't shame him. And Jesus doesn't say, well, until you really get your faith act together, I'm not doing anything for your son. No. Jesus still heals the boy and delivers him from this demon. When you're in the valley, sometimes you're just too weak to have all the kind of faith in the world. And Jesus knows that. Sometimes all you can muster up is a little. But Jesus will take our little and use it for his glory to help us. Now, just when you think the story's over, it tells us at the end here that in verse 28, his disciples pull Jesus aside in private and they ask him, why couldn't we cast that demon out? And Jesus says in verse 29, this kind can come out by nothing but prayer and fasting. I want to share four quick bullet points with you. It's going to be very rapid fire. Four quick things I think we can learn from this story. The first is what we've been talking about throughout this whole thing. Jesus is with us on the mountain and in the valleys. It's important to remember this. David would write in Psalm 139 verses 7 to 10, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, Sheol is the word, hell, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me, your right hand will hold me fast. David's like, I can't go anywhere and escape your presence because you're always with me. In Psalm 46, 1, it says, God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in times of need, whether you're on the mountain or in the valleys. And David in Psalm 23 reminds us that he's with us in the valleys when he writes, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you are with me. That's why I will not fear. God is with us on the mountains and in the valleys. Number two, you always have to come down off the mountain. Real life happens in the valleys. I first started off in full-time ministry and youth ministry. Did that for the first four years before coming here to help plant Cornerstone. And um, I can tell you, I always had a mixture of joy and sorrow in youth ministry every year at summer camp. Because I would see teenagers who would get away, literally on a mountaintop experience, go away to summer camp, you know, start to allow the Lord to do a good work in their hearts. They, they get broken, they get emotional, they, they humble themselves. They many times would get saved, many times rededicate their lives. And it would just be these wonderful summer camps of just, you know, getting close to God, drawing near to Him, getting their hearts right, all of this good stuff, right? But then I always knew last day of summer camp, you got to go off the mountain. You got to go back home where reality is. And I knew that sometimes they were going back to families where mom and dad would be hostile to Christianity. They would, they would be mad that they got saved. 
or at, at the very least, not really excited for them. And they would go back to their friends and they'd go back to their schools. And I always had this ongoing tension in my heart of joy, what God did, and then this angst about now how they have to face reality. But that is reality. You can't stay on the mountain forever. Real life happens in the valleys. This is where faith and life merge. This is where we invite Jesus into every dark day, into every unexpected disappointment, and we say, Lord, you are the same God of the valleys as you are of the mountains. And because you are the God of the mountains and the God of the valleys, I'm going to trust you even in my real life situations. This is not just ethereal stuff. You know, faith is not supposed to be just this, you know, cosmic head knowledge. This is supposed to be where real life and real faith intersect in the valley of reality. And every single one of us live there, where we invite Jesus into every part of this. You know, we sang earlier in our worship time the song Graves into Gardens, and part of that song I didn't even ask Micah to do it. it was, you know, I already had this in my notes, and I thought it was timely that, that he chose to sing it this morning. Because part of the chorus goes, because the God of the mountains is the God of the valley, and there's not a place your mercy and grace won't find me again. Number three, the most difficult challenges in the valleys must be met with prayer and fasting. I will tell you, you read any Bible commentary, it is unknown why this particular demon was so difficult to cast out, but it was. In this particular case, his disciples were unable to cast out the demon, and they asked him privately, why couldn't we do this? Because they had done this before. Jesus sent them out two by two. They had already been in the name of Jesus casting out demons, but this time they couldn't. And when they asked, Jesus says in verse 29, this kind, what makes it different from the others? It doesn't tell us, but Jesus just says this kind of demon would only come out with prayer and fasting. Well, then the question becomes, is it that prayer and fasting makes me more powerful in my spirit to do things that are, that are more uncommon? Maybe, but I don't, I don't really think that that's what he was trying to teach us here. I think simply what he's trying to teach us is that through prayer and fasting, through the disciplines of prayer and fasting, my life is more faith-filled and less fear-filled. The more I seek him through prayer and the more through fasting I deny the physical part of my appetites so that I can then grow in a deeper way with the Lord in moments when difficult things demand them, then I need to practice those disciplines. Because some things in your life, I'm not talking about demon stuff, although, you know, demonic possession is a reality, but that aside for the moment, I'm just talking about some of you are going through very, very difficult situations. And, and you're trying to find solutions, and you're trying to figure out how, how, to, how to make this better. Maybe this kind will only get better through prayer and fasting. You've tried everything else, but now maybe it's time for some prayer and fasting. And maybe then, as your heart is filled more with faith and less with fear, you'll see the mighty hand of God at work. Last one, number four. I like this about the story. Even a little belief with unbelief is better than no belief at all. This is the story here of the dad. He was honest enough to admit that he had some unbelief, but Jesus was honorable enough to give the dad what he needed anyway. The mighty hand of God is not dependent on the mighty faith of man. I'm going to say that again. The mighty hand of God is not dependent upon the mighty faith of man. If you think God will only move based on your level of faith, you've put yourself in charge of God. You are manipulating the hand of God. If your theology says, the more faith I have, then God will do more for me. No, wait a minute. God wants us to exercise faith. God wants us to enter into what he is wanting to do with belief. But it's okay to say, I got some unbelief and I got some doubt, and God's mighty hand will still move. 
because God is the one who is sovereign and God is the one who is powerful. And God knows that there are times that we're just so weak and weary and discouraged that we can't muster up more than a tiny bit of belief and then say to him, but I got some unbelief, can you help me with that too? And God will show himself strong because the mighty hand of God is not dependent upon the mighty faith of man. Thank God that he knows sometimes we're just too weary or tired to have much faith. But when we just open ourselves to Jesus and say, but Lord, I'm yours, please do your good work that you know I need in his mercy. God does exceedingly abundantly beyond what we could hope, ask, or imagine, because that's God. I believe, Lord, but help my unbelief. Amen? Amen. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that you are good and awesome and powerful and mighty. And you are the same God of the mountains as you are of the valleys. And there are times, Lord, that in life we will get a glimpse of your glory and goodness. And we love those mountaintop experiences. But we know, Lord, because we live in a fallen sinful world, that most of life is lived near or in the valley. But you're there too. So help us to live well, to trust you, to seek you. Yes, maybe sometimes even through prayer and fasting when things are difficult and dark. But we love you, Lord, and we thank you that you love us so much. You're with us, whether on the mountain or in the valley, to do your good and powerful work. Lord, I pray right now for those who are finding themselves right in the darkest valley and feeling like things are hopeless, that you would show yourself strong to them right now, Lord. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. You are with them, Lord. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? You're with us everywhere. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me, your right hand will hold me fast. Hold us fast, Lord sheltered in the palm of your hand. So whether good days or bad days, we will know your abiding presence, your power at work, even when we feel like we have very little faith, Lord. Thank you for showing yourself strong. Do your good work where it is needed most right now. You know, Lord, you know your people. You know the sheep of your pasture. You know those who really need you in desperate ways. With tears, they would cry out like this, Dad, show compassion and help me, Lord. I pray you would do that, Lord. Glorify yourself in the process. Strengthen our hearts, Lord. We're needy people. We love you. We praise you together in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen and amen. God bless you all.